You're listening to episode 83, How to Talk to Your Child When Their Friend or Classmate Has Cancer. Hello, my friends. Okay, I know I say this a lot, but I'm so excited to have you here today because I get to introduce you to my Holly. Everyone should have a Holly in their life. They're that positive, optimistic, skilled, loving friend. And I got to have her as my supervisor in child life. And I'm not going to tell you how many years ago that was because that will make us both feel old. But when it comes to talking about cancer with kids, there in my mind is no one that compares to Holly Sin. So we are going to be talking about how to talk to your child when their friend or classmate has cancer and what are the, some of the key things you can go over. And I think this is great for teachers to hear. This is great for parents to hear, and we're just going to go over a really open, kind, and educational way to talk to your kiddos. And then I'll also be sharing with you this new productivity drink that I've been trying called Magic Mind, which I can't wait to tell you about. All right, let's get started. Well, why don't you just start off by talking a bit about yourself and where you come from and your experience in the child life field? Okay. I have been at Anova Children's Hospital, wow, for this September, it'll be 17 years working on the PT Monk unit. And I came by way of Mississippi, born and raised there and went to school at University of Southern Mississippi, where they had a bachelor's program in child life that I was lucky enough to find. And then did my internship for child life at Children's Medical Center in Dallas. And then I actually was able to find a child life fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. And that was a year long adventure, just scheduled for one year. And it happened to be in the Hemonc outpatient clinic there. Really, that was my first exposure to hematology oncology. And in that case, I actually did more work with the hematology population than I did with the oncology population, just because of how. The position was designed, but ended up helping out a lot with oncology as well. So when that was over, I looked for jobs every which way, every coast on the United States, and ended up here in Virginia at Anova Children's Hospital on their inpatient hemonc unit, which also has kids that are overflow, basically, kind of what we would call in the healthcare world as clean kids. And <laughs> so like your appendectomies or <laughs> kids that have gotten their tonsils out and just need some observation. You're giving away our, our hospital lingo there. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a, it's a good thing, though, to be considered a clean kid. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, let's not talk about the dirty ones. <laughs> yes, right, right. <laughs> what do you think it is that kept you so engaged for 17 years with hematology, oncology families? Like, what's special about them? I really enjoy being able to create relationships and see someone through like difficult times. And so I think the hemoc population really gave me that opportunity to work with families on a more long-term basis and really have opportunities to not just help them through a procedure, but also be there to help celebrate the positives that happen in their life, the graduations from kindergarten, the birthdays, you know, different huge milestones that happen in their treatments. And I just, talking about it now, it makes me, it just, it, is very family oriented in that fact. And I'm a very family oriented person. And so I guess, you know, it's kind of a little bit of an expansion of my family and being able to be there to share in the highs and the lows and knowing that I'm trying to do all I can to try and make those lows a a little less low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, in honor of Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, which is the September We thought it would be a good idea to talk about how do we explain and talk to the siblings, cousins, classmates of these kiddos who have cancer. And you have a lot of experience in going to schools and talking with siblings and 
children from all different ages and stages. And I wonder if you would share with our parents who listen a way they could go about this conversation. And I, I want to say, of course, this is built on cancer. Kind of this is the topic of our conversation. But really, what do you think? We could probably apply this to many different diagnoses. I could even think COVID at this time. Just this idea of being separate or being different then and how do you approach these tough conversations? And so would you kind of lead us through what you do in your practice? Sure, sure. Yeah. And I do. I think it does. It applies. It can apply to many different diagnoses or just, you know, changes like you mentioned COVID that we have going on. And, you know, one of the biggest things when I talk with parents or I talk with schools before going into a school is, you know, being open and honest. I'm a very big supporter of honesty. And that doesn't mean that you have to give all the fine little details and everything. We, of course, want to make sure that our honest explanation is age appropriate. So choosing words that make sense for that age group to help explain things is what's going to be the most important thing. I think it's important to use one thing that I find very useful is using analogies that kids might be familiar with. So, for example, I might explain to some siblings that are maybe like four or five, six years old, I might use a superhero analogy to kind of explain how cancer is in the body and how chemotherapy works with labeling the cancer as the villainous. So, let's take Spider-Man and Venom. Maybe the cancer could be called Venom, who we know is the evil Spider-Man guy, and that the chemo is known as Spider-Man, who goes in to help get rid of the bad guy. And sometimes, you know, we have to have that discussion of sometimes good guys get in the way and get a little hurt, but we fix them back up. And that's a way to talk about blood counts changing. So I won't get into too many details, but I think it's really important to find an analogy that kids can relate to in order to help them understand. And you're you're not sugarcoating anything. You're you're being honest, you're being age appropriate. And I think the biggest thing is to start basic. We never know where kids are coming from, whether that in your own family, what they've witnessed on TV, what they've overheard in conversations, or especially children from outside of your family that are maybe classmates. We don't know about different cultural beliefs of everything. So I think starting basic and then allowing children to kind of guide that conversation of what they want to know, how much they want to know is really important. And it also gives them a little bit of control over that as well with trying to help them not get overwhelmed too quickly. You know, a lot of the concerns, I think that's all such good advice, but a lot of the concerns parents have is how do I deal with the emotional reaction of the kids I am telling this information to? So what is your experience and how do kids react to you when you're explaining this in a classroom setting or one-on-one with a sibling? How, what are the emotional reactions you see from kids as you're explaining it in this way? Yeah, when I've seen a variety of reactions, I've had kids that are very engaged and just like soaking up every single word that comes out of my mouth. I've also had some kids that appear very flat affect. And I'm wondering to myself, am I even making sense to this kid? Mm -hmm. And then I've had kids kind of like pound me with questions. I've had kids cry. And, you know, I think it's important that every to know that every child is going to react differently. And that's okay. There's no set way that we should expect anybody to react when we're telling them news of a cancer diagnosis or of a treatment changing because everybody's ability to cope with the information they're being given is different. And so we just want to be supportive for that. And if if kids are crying, it's okay to let them know, you know, it's okay to cry and be upset about this. I think something that goes into play with that too is us as adults and caregivers who are providing this information to be honest about our emotions too and letting kids know like if say it's a mom explaining to a sibling, you know, mom doesn't like this either. I am not happy about this information either. I wish I could change it. I think it's important for adults to to be open and honest about their emotions. And I know a lot of parents that I've worked with and want to try and always put on this brave face. And I 
I understand that. And I think that's important too, but I think it's also important to let your kids know that, yeah, you're not liking this either. And they're going to be more open with you than about how they feel. They're going to feel like communication is truly open because a lot of times kids want to try and protect the adults that are their caregivers. And so I think it's important that if, if they know that those lines of communication are open, they're more likely to share those feelings that they have with you if those feel, as those feelings change over time, with age, with circumstances. Oh, that's such a good point. It's I can even think yesterday my daughter accidentally like hit me in the face, no big deal. And I was <laughs> like, ow. And then all of a sudden she starts doing this like really crazy dance. And I start laughing and I realize what she's doing is trying to protect me from the pain I'm in. And she's three, you know, it's such a pure moment, but yep. that's the it's the nail on the head. Like, yes, they are trying to protect us. So when we are vulnerable and I say, this really hurts, mommy needs to take a second, you know, that shows her the next time she does it, she could do it too. So I think that's really good advice. So I'm excited to share with y'all. I mentioned it at the beginning before Holly and I started chatting about the world's first productivity drink that I've been trying called Magic Mind. And if you've been a part of this community for a while, you know that I heavily <laughs> rely on caffeine to be productive at the hospital and at home. But the problem I experience is that like inevitable crash that comes in the afternoon and just the desire to have more and more and more. When creator James Bashera of Magic Mind was diagnosed with a heart condition, he had to get really creative and his doctor made him give up a lot of his daily caffeine intake. So he worked with doctors and food scientists to develop Magic Mind. It has more benefits than just actually keeping you awake and includes ingredients to help you stress less, think more clearly, and stay on task. It's this really delicious small green drink and you honestly feel just healthy when you're drinking it. And it's got all natural ingredients. If you would like to try it alongside me, go to magicmind.co slash childlifeoncall and enter code childlifeoncall20 to get 20% off. That's magicmind.co slash childlifeoncall, code childlifeoncall20. We'll be right back. As a child life specialist who has worked with hundreds of children and families over the past decade, I know that no two children are the same. That means I need access to tools that can easily adapt to whatever situation I'm in. SmileMakers has thousands of unique items that help me navigate every scenario. Whether I'm looking for stickers and prizes for goodie bags for my patients or even my own kids, or I'm in child life specialist mode working clinically to help a child cope with a medical procedure. I'm happy to support SmileMakers because they are a company who prioritizes the mental and emotional well-being of children by offering smiles on every page. Head to SmileMakers.com when you're looking for a tool, toy, or prize to help a child smile. Use code ONCALL20 for 20% off your order of smile-making stickers, toys, patient supplies, and more. Yeah, I think it's important, you know, even like you said, like with a hit in the face, I mean, that's not really a little thing, but we think of the world being as crazy as it is now with all that kids are exposed to and everything. It's important for them not just to overhear and assume that, oh, well, I have to be strong and brave because mommy doesn't ever get upset about this either. And it honestly, in the end, I think makes them more scared than anything. And so how do you wrap up a conversation too? Because I think that's sometimes the fear is like, okay, so I've said what I need to say. I've been honest. I've given analogies. But how do I finish this really difficult conversation? You know, definitely I'll, I'll validate that I gave a lot of information and that I am always and your parents and your nurses and everybody who is caring for your friend, your brother, your sister, your cousin are always available to answer questions as they come up, that it's okay to have a lot of questions. It's okay to not have a lot of questions, but it's important when you do have questions to ask those questions so that you can get answers that make sense to you and that will keep your mind from wandering so that we can give you all the right answers and, and help support you. And letting them know that they're an important part of the process too. It's not just the child who is ill, but that it is very hard. I've known several families where it's been harder on the siblings than it has been for the child that's diagnosed as far as coping wise goes because mom and dad are away, schedules get changed and everything. So really letting them know that you're there for them to, to help support them through anything, making special time for them, I think is important as well. 
So it's it's almost not like shutting the door on the conversation and saying, okay, we've done it, check mark. It's like, okay, this is the beginning of many ongoing conversations. Definitely, definitely. And I always tell if, I, if I'm doing kind of an education session, especially like at bedside in the hospital with a sibling, I always be like, you can always ask your mom questions. And if she doesn't know, she has my phone number and she can always call me or you can come back again to visit. And then with like school settings and everything, I'll always tell the teacher in front of the class too that, you know, if, if kids have questions, you can tell your teacher and she can email me. And we can get those questions answered and everything. So I think it's important to keep that door of communication open and flowing. Well, you were just so awesome. And before I have to let you go, I was wondering if you could give us any of your favorite resources that you give to families that are dealing with childhood cancer. Oh, man, there's so many. (laughs) (laughs) I know. My resource list has has definitely grown over the years, but it's funny because one of my New favorite resources is actually from someone you have had on your show before, Elizabeth Billups, called A Puddle Jumper's Guide to Kicking Cancer. After I actually heard your podcast with her and then looked at that book, and it is it is a fabulous book. Oh, I love it. So that's a great book with awesome pictures and very good child-friendly explanations, as well as a glossary in the back. There's also another book called Chemo Craziness and Comfort put out by the American Childhood Cancer Organization. If you look it up, it says it's written for kids ages 6 to 12. Honestly, in my opinion, it's for anybody that can read. So it breaks everything down. It has chapters. It actually has a place in the back for patients to journal. It talks about after treatment. It talks about returning to school. It talks about friends. So that's another really good, easy to understand resource as well. I could give you a list a mile long, but I know we only have a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think those are those are really great resources, and I'll make sure to link to them. And then my final question for you is probably the most difficult question. Oh, gosh. Who has been your favorite intern throughout your child life career? <laughs> I think it was this girl maybe named Katie. (laughs) Thank God. I I have been wanting to ask you this question for years. (laughs) I think it, and I think she has like her own podcast now or something (laughs) too. I know it's crazy to think. I mean, I'm sorry you just breed greatness and that's just what it is. (laughs) (laughs) I like to think I had a little something to do with your, your confidence and your, and your success in life. You know, I think there's those people who you meet in your life and you look at them and you're like, oh, my God, you're just as weird as I am. And I think we had that. (laughs) I fully support that. (laughs) I fully support that. (laughs) Well, I love you, Holly. And how if people want to follow along with you and just see the antics of Holly Sen, how can they do that? Yeah. So I'm happy to have people follow me along on Facebook, which is just at Holly Sen on Instagram, which is at H-E-S-E-N-N-2-3. Well, I love you, my friend. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for having me on and best of luck with all you do, my darling. Thank you, love. Thank you so much, Holly, for being here today on our 12-minute talk. I hope this was helpful for you guys. And we will see you again next week with another parent story.